I know that right here, right now, over 50% of every American adult wants to be their own boss, wants to be in control of their own destiny. Look around and they say, I just don't know what I should do. That's the exact situation that I was in when I launched my first business. And the tip I'll share with you, if you're an undecided entrepreneur, is this. Start with the practice business. And then with that, that can transform eventually into that business that is a passion of yours. It was Einstein that said compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Right. It was Rothschilds that said no, compound interest tax free. A dollar doubled 20 times is a million dollars if it's tax free. If it's tax is earned in a bank or credit union, in a 25% tax bracket, it's only worth 72,000. Wow. When you could have had a million. our nine episode docu-series, Money Revealed. So as you can see, we're on eight, which means we're coming to a close. This information, the feedback we've been getting, it's been awesome. So thank you for that. And thank you for taking the journey with me. Also remember, right now, during the free viewing period, we're offering a deep discount on owning this wisdom called Money Revealed. So I encourage you to make that investment own this information, just find the package that's right for you and order that package and we'll be so happy to fulfill that order. So here we go, we're in episode eight, let's dive in. Ryan Lebeck is a legend in the internet marketing world. He's the best-selling author of the book, Ask, and this book revolutionized how digital marketers approach their businesses. Now he's got a new book out called Choose, and you should not start a business until you read this book or at least watch this interview and read this book. And if you're in business now, this interview is something that's going to help set you up for greater success moving forward. Enjoy this interview with Ryan Lebeck. Ryan, thanks so much for being here. It's good to be here with you today. Tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do. So we have a company where we teach entrepreneurs how to launch and grow their business. And it's based on my own personal experience launching businesses in 23 different markets. So we have a best-selling book that's called Ask, a book that's called Choose that helps you identify what market you should go into and how to start the right business for you. Perfect. So tell me, were you born an entrepreneur or how'd you come to this? I definitely was not born an entrepreneur. In fact, I tell people I'm one of the most risk-adverse entrepreneurs that you're ever going to meet. After college, I grew up, my dad worked for the government. He worked nights, he was a shipping clerk. My mom was cutting hair in the basement of our house, so I grew up very blue collar. I was the first person in my family to go to college. I was fortunate enough to get into an Ivy League school and I studied neuroscience. So my parents thought I was gonna go on to become a doctor, which is like the safest path that you could follow. Um, I decided to go into finance instead. After college, I worked on Wall Street for the investment bank Goldman Sachs, and then I eventually made my way to China. And I started working for the financial services company, AIG. And I was opening up offices for AIG across China. And I was living out of hotels. I was on an airplane every single week and I was burnt out. I was in my mid twenties and I have had what I call a quarter life crisis. I said, there has to be a better way. My wife and I were married, but we had this bi country marriage. She was in grad school in Hong Kong. I was based out of Shanghai. We'd see each other once or twice a month. And I said, I want to do something different. And it led me to this path of building a business so I could live life on my own terms. I said, I told people, I said, listen, I don't want to live my life in a box, traveling in a box, to work in a box. I want to be able to build something that gives me freedom, gives me the ability to make an impact, and someday leave a legacy. So I'm assuming it was smooth sailing once you made that decision, right? <laughs> the first business that we launched ended up being a complete failure. And it's one of the lessons I teach entrepreneurs that I work with, and it's the importance of not going into a fad market. So the first business that we started was in the tiny, obscure market of teaching people how to make Scrabble tile jewelry. So my wife 
at the time, this is 2007, 2008, stumbled upon a website which was brand new at the time, a website called Etsy.com. If you're not familiar, it's a, a site that's like eBay for handmade goods. And at the time, it was a brand new site. And she stumbled on this jewelry that was selling like crazy that involved using Scrabble tiles and origami paper. And she said, hey, honey, we can do this. We're in China. There's all the origami paper that you could want in the world. We have access to inexpensive labor. Let's manufacture this jewelry and let's import it into the United States. And I said, honey, I don't want to do that. That's going to tie us to a factory in southern China. We want a location independent business. We want to be able to travel and live life on our own terms. So she said, OK, put it to bed. A few weeks later, she reaches out to me again and she says, look, remember that Scrabble tile jewelry thing? I said, I thought we closed the door on that thing. She says, no, no, time out, time out, time out. There's this woman. She's not selling the jewelry. She's teaching people how to make the jewelry. And the cool thing about Etsy is that you can look at a person's sales history. So you can see how many sales someone's making every single day. And we did the math. And she was selling this tutorial for $25 and she was making 20 to 30 sales a day. We did the math. I said, that's like $15,000 a month. And it, it's all profit. She's just selling this PDF. Like, we can do this. And so we bought her products. It wasn't terribly good. Said, we said, we can build a better mousetrap. We built our own tutorial. My wife learned how to make the jewelry. We took photographs. We did the, the text. We started selling it. First month, we made $1,000, $2,000, $4,000, $5,000, $9,000 a month. We said, we're going to be rich. Like, this is, this is great. This is going to be great. And it wasn't that much longer after that that the worldwide Scrabble tile jewelry market crashed. It turns out the whole thing was just a fad. People stopped buying the jewelry, so everyone selling the jewelry wasn't making any money. People stopped buying tutorials on how to make the jewelry. And before we knew it, we were basically broke. I'd quit my job. My wife was in grad school. We're living in a 400 square foot apartment. We had that moment where we looked at each other and we said, now what? What do we do now? And we decided to move back to the States and start over. Mid-20s, late-20s at this point. We had two suitcases. We moved to Brownsville, Texas, the poorest zip code in the country, about a mile away from the Mexican border, which is where my wife grew up, where she was from. So we wanted to be close to her parents. And we started over. We started our first real business that did go on to become successful. So I know what it's like having those ramen noodle and bologna sandwich days. I know what it's like on a you know, $50 a week food budget. I know what it's like having bars on the windows and a mattress on the floor. I know what those days are like. And I find that's one of the things that holds people back from going after it. People want to know, do you have to give up good in order to go for great? So it's obvious after hearing that story why you would write a book called Choose, but we'll get to that in a second. From the time I've known you and heard you speak, a part of your depth comes from a significant health challenge that I think also colors your perspective. Tell us about that because I want the people who hear you to understand like I do that this is a deep well that we're dipping into, not a shallow well. So after we launched that Scrabble Tile jewelry business and it was a failure, we moved back to the States and I launched my first real business that became successful, which was in a random obscure market teaching people how to care for their orchids, as in the flower. And we took that business from nothing to $25,000 a month in 18 months. My wife quit the job that she was working at the time. We go all in, take that business to half a million dollars a year. But I thought it was a fluke. Like I thought it was just a, I was so scared that the same thing was gonna happen again. So I decided to diversify into another market to make my parents happy that I was actually using my education from college. We went into the how to improve your memory market. So we started teaching people memory techniques. So we went into that business, took that to half a million dollars a year. Well, before I know it, I was going into market after market. I went to 23 different markets, which is, which is crazy. Um, and at that time, my first son was born. And right now, you see me on camera right now, I'm about you know, 185 pounds, 190 pounds, um, in pretty good shape. But after my son was born, I started mysteriously losing weight. Again, I'm running these 23 different businesses. I'm a new dad, I'm losing all this weight, and I'm tired all the time. At the time, I just chalked it up to being a new dad and trying to run a fast-growing company. But my wife insisted that I apply for life insurance. She said, you're you know, responsible for someone else's life now. Apply for life insurance. So I did. Apply for life insurance, and I go away on a trip, come back, and there's a letter waiting for me on my desk, and it's from the life insurance company. I open up the letter, and the letter says, denied. I just turned 30 years old. Denied life insurance. Now, if you're denied life insurance, typically it means something serious is going on. So I call up the life insurance agent, and if you fly to, for life insurance, you know that they do a medical exam. I didn't have the results of that exam, but the 
agent in. So I talked to him and he said, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I think you want to sit down. And he proceeded to give me the numbers from my lab results and I, I wrote them down. And then I tell people I made the biggest mistake of my life. I went to Google. I went to Google to find out what they meant. And I typed in my numbers into Google and they came back, kidney failure, renal system shutdown, and pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is like a death sentence. And so I'm freaking out. And I remember that night my wife asked me, she said, I saw we got the life insurance letter, is everything okay? And I said, well, not exactly, we need to talk. So she starts breaking down and schedules a doctor's appointment the very next morning. Now at this point, I was in denial. I thought that they had messed up my results with somebody else. I thought somehow the results got um, swapped. So we go to the doctor the next day and they draw blood. They do some lab results. They say, we're going to order this stat. Hang tight in the waiting room. We'll order this right now. And I remember when the doctor came back out in the waiting room. He comes to me, grabs me by the shoulders, and he says, Mr. Levesque, you should be in a coma right now. We're taking you to the emergency room. So they rush me to the ER, spend 10 days in ICU, in intensive care. I've got a six-month-old baby at home. I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to die. And it turns out I was an undiagnosed juvenile diabetic. I had type 1 diabetes, and I was one of these guys in my 20s. I never went to go see a doctor. I lived in China for five years. I never saw a doctor when I was living in China. So I'd just gone undiagnosed all these years, and it, my body had reached a point where it was shutting down. And so I emerged from that experience, and I said, if I want to do something with my life, right? if I want to do something with my life, now's the time to do it. And I'd had this financial success in all these different markets, and I'd worked hard to get there, but what I realized is that I, I wasn't impacting a large number of people. I had something here that had worked for me to transform my family's life. Listen, I grew up blue collar. I grew up, you know, my parents didn't go to college. Um, I grew up as, as working class as it comes. And I've been able to build this great life for myself, and I wanted to share that with people who wanted to do the same thing for their family and make a difference in the world. And so that's why I published my first book, Ask. And I revealed what I consider to be my secret family recipe, which is how I had success in all of these 23 different markets. And that's the path that started the company that we built. And we've got 60 employees and hundreds of thousands of people have read our books and millions of people around the world have now followed this process that we now teach entrepreneurs on how to have success in your business. So let's stay in your book, Ask. The people who are taking your courses, what do they learn? So whenever I bring up this topic of ask, people say, well, is it as simple as just ask people what they want and give it to them? And the answer is not exactly. See, the process of asking questions is a bit counterintuitive. You can't just ask someone, what should I sell? How much should I charge it for? And then deliver it because people don't know what they want. In fact, you've probably heard the quote from Henry Ford. You know, he's famous for saying, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses. Steve Jobs is famous for saying, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. And the reason why those statements ring true is because they are true. People don't know what they want. But they do know a few things. They do know, for example, what they don't want. In fact, if I were to ask you, you know, what's your, what's your dream car? What, could you, what do you want in your dream car? You're going to access a part of your brain that's speculating. You're going to guess. But if I were to ask you, think about the car you're driving right now. What's one thing about your car right now that kind of bugs you a little bit, that's annoying, that frustrates you? Most of us can pick out what that thing is. And it gives us a clue on the types of questions that you want to ask to understand your market, to understand your audience at a deep emotional level. And the ask method is all about the nuance of asking the right questions in the right way to the right people to understand your audience and who they are. So you can not only better sell, but more importantly, better serve. And that's what the ask method is all about. I remember when that book came out, I probably had a dozen friends recommend it to me. It was a really useful book for entrepreneurs, but now you have written what appears to be a prequel to that book. So what's a new book and why was that needed? So when you write a book, like Ask, one of the great things that happens is you get a bunch of letters, emails, messages from people who tell you how much the book has changed their life. But you also get messages from people who say, I read the book and it didn't work. I tried what you teach and it didn't work for me. And when I got letters like that, it frustrated me. It pained me because I put my blood, sweat, and tears, my heart and soul into that book. And as many entrepreneurs as this worked for, there were people that 
used the methodology and didn't have success. And so I wanted to get to the bottom of that. And it started off, it kicked off what became the biggest research project of my life. And I started looking at what were the reasons why people were failing? What mistakes were they making? Where did I go wrong? Did I leave something out? And what I found is it all came down to one thing. People were choosing bad markets. And there's a metaphor that I use in my teaching and it's like this. You know, when you start a business, it's like deciding to throw your raft in a river. Now, you're building your business because you want to take yourself to some destination, whether it's achieving financial freedom, making an impact, leaving a legacy, changing your life and the life of your customers. And so that river is the thing that's gonna get you to that destination. Now, you can have the best boat money can buy. You can hire the best crew. You can buy the best equipment. You can row 18 hours a day. But if that boat is facing the wrong direction, or worse yet, you throw that boat into a river that doesn't have any water in it, or a river that's gonna swallow you up whole because it's just too big, you're never gonna get to your destination. And that's what I found is that people were choosing bad rivers. And so I asked myself, I said, what if I could teach people how to find that hidden river? The river that was just right. The river that's gonna take you to exactly where you wanna go. And so I embarked on this research project and I looked at each of the 23 markets that we went into. I studied every single one of my clients and students and looked at what were the factors that separated the businesses and markets that were successful compared to the ones that failed. Now I'm a huge fan, I was inspired by the work of Jim Collins, who's written Built to Last, Good to Great, Great by Choice. Now Jim Collins' work centers around studying the most iconic companies in the world and what separates those that have been successful for decades from those that failed along the way. And I wanted to do the same thing for our small niche businesses. What was it that separated them? And what we found was that there were seven factors. Seven factors that when you get these things right, you're setting yourself up for success. Every single one of our most successful businesses checked off these seven boxes. The ones that failed were missing one of these key ingredients. And that is the subject of this book, Choose. Okay, so obviously I have to know, what are the seven factors? So when it comes to choosing the right market and starting the right business, there are seven factors. And I'll talk about a few of them right now. So one of the things that we discovered is that every single one of the most successful markets have what we call the five market must-haves. These are five factors that if you want to be successful, you want to make sure your market has. And I'll go through them. The first is what we call an evergreen market. Now an evergreen market is in contrast with the fad market. Evergreen market is a market that was relevant 10 years ago and it's a market that'll be relevant 10 years from now. Recent examples of fad markets, in my experience, I share the story of my Scrabble tile jewelry business, that's how I learned that lesson the, the first time, but a lot of people have experienced this recently. So fidget spinners is a perfect example of a fad market. It took over the world and then disappeared off a cliff. Another one that a lot of people have been affected by is the Bitcoin market. Now there was a time recently where you could not turn a corner without everybody talking about Bitcoin and building businesses around Bitcoin, membership sites and online programs and exchanges. And you saw the price of Bitcoin skyrocket and then fall off a cliff. Now, one of the things that you can do is you can use a tool called Google Trends. Now, Google Trends is a tool that Google puts out to analyze the keyword volume of keywords. So how many people are online searching for information on Bitcoin or fidget spinners? And you can see the global trends. Is it going up? Is it cyclical? Is it going down? Or is it stable? Now I learned the hard way what happens when you go into a fad market. They go up, but then they fall off a cliff. And so some of the markets that are evergreen markets, markets that have been here for, they're here to stay, are markets like orchid care, markets like leadership skills. You're looking for things that are gonna be relevant, that are gonna fuel your soul and fill your bank account for years and years and years to come not something that's gonna be here today and gone tomorrow, so that's the first thing. But being in an evergreen market turns out is not enough. You also want a market that is an enthusiast market. Now what that means is in contrast with a problem solution market, you want a market where people are consumers in that same space for years and years. So an example of a problem solution market would be something like the, the, the flood removal market. Like if you have a flooded basement, you call up a company, they help you get rid of that flooding damage, and then you move on. There are no clubs, there are no Facebook groups, there are no newsletters to subscribe to, to you know, stay in that world. In a problem solution business, you constantly have to chase after a new customer. 
versus an enthusiast market, you can acquire a customer once and sell to that same customer over and over again. So an example of an enthusiast market would be something like guitar. Someone learns how to play guitar, they want to be in that market for years. They're buying music, they're buying instruments, they're buying equipment. Dogs is another great market. So if you serve dog owners, you get someone who brings a puppy into their home and then they buy all the things you, you know what it's like when you buy, uh, 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 you know, if you've got a dog or and know anybody who has a dog, you've got um, doggy bowls, doggy treats, doggy crates, doggy clothes, doggy Christmas ornaments. I mean, people spend crazy amounts of money on their pets. Um, the market serving entrepreneurs is another great example. People who are entrepreneurs tend to be entrepreneurs for years and years and years. So those are examples of enthusiast markets, but it's not enough to be in an evergreen and an enthusiast market. You have to solve market must have number three, which is an urgent problem in the context of that evergreen and enthusiast market. What do we mean by that? Well, if you go into the doggy market, for example, you can't go into that market and expect to have a ton of success if you're gonna sell something like doggy mugs, right? Nobody wakes up in the middle of the night and says, honey, we gotta get this doggy mug tonight, tomorrow. What you're looking for is what we call a $10,000 problem, a burning problem that people need to solve right here, right now. An example in the dog market would be a dog peeing on the rug. You bring a new puppy home and the dog pees on the rug, pees on the sofa, pees on the clothing, pees on the bed. It reaches a boiling point where you say, enough is enough. We've got to solve this thing now. A story I share in the book is Dana Olbermann and her husband, they help parents with young kids get their kids to sleep through the night. That's a perfect example. If you've ever had young kids at home, you know what it's like when you're trying to get some sleep and nobody's getting any sleep in the house. That's a problem. That's a $10,000 problem. So that's market must have number three. Number four is a market that has what we call future problems. Now, when you solve that first $10,000 problem for someone, you have this opportunity to become their trusted advisor for life. If you help someone, if you're the dog whisperer and you help someone get their dog to become potty trained, the only question they have is, hey, my dog's barking. How do I get her to stop barking? Or my dog's pulling on the leash. How do I help her with this thing? What you're looking for is a market where you have, when you help someone become successful in that first thing that you help them with, that success leads to a new problem. So in the entrepreneurship market, we'll take that for example. Once you choose your market and decide what business to start, the next question that you might be asking is, well, how do I figure out what to sell? Then once you have success selling that product, you might be saying, I'm doing all the work myself. How do I hire my first employee to get some help? So every level of success leads to a future problem that you have the opportunity to solve. So that's number four. Number five is what we call P. WMs. So I first learned this phrase from the late, great Gary Halbert, who's largely regarded as one of the greatest direct response copywriters of all time. Now PWM stands for players with money. You want to find a market where you have people who spend a disproportionate amount of their income in that area of their life. Now it's not to say you're selling to billionaires or millionaires, but you're looking for an area that people spend a disproportionate amount of their money in that, that area. So for example, golf is a, is a classic example. If you know anybody who plays golf, they spend crazy amounts of money on golf equipment, golf instruction, golf trips, uh, vacations, and so forth. Wine is another great example. People who are fans of wine will spend a ton of money in that area of their life. Dogs, another great example. If you have a dog, I mean, gosh, our little four and a half pound chihuahua, the amount of money we spend pound for pound on that little girl is incredible. And so you're looking for something like that. You're looking for evidence of PWMs. So evergreen market, enthusiast market, urgent problem, future problems, and PWMs. That's great. Okay. Even as you're going through this, I'm thinking of some of my own businesses and thinking A plus, A plus, C minus. So those five things were just one of the seven. Tell us a couple of more. So the five market must-haves are one of the characteristics, and I'll give you a couple more. So one of the things that we also did when we looked at each of our businesses is we looked at the keyword volume in each of those businesses to analyze market size. And what we found was one of the most striking discoveries of my entire life. We looked at all of our successful businesses and we found that the keyword search volume, in other words, the size of the market as measured by Google Trends, a free tool, was all within a very narrow 
range. And every single one of our failed businesses was either too big or too small. And so one of the things that we debated literally for months is we said, should we reveal what those keywords are? Should we reveal what our most successful markets were and what those keywords were? And what we decided to do in the book was reveal it all. We decided to share exactly what those keywords were so you could take your keyword in your business and measure it against those benchmark keywords and see if your business is either too big, too small, or right inside what we call the market size sweet spot. So that's another one of the factors. So just for someone who's watching this that might not know, explain what a keyword is. So one of the things I teach is the importance of identifying what's called your bullseye keyword. Now your bullseye keyword is a keyword that describes the thing that people would be searching for online that represents the transformation or process that you help people through in their business. I'll give you an example. One keyword would be orchid care. Orchid care represents the bullseye keyword in our orchid care business because we help people care for their orchids as in the flower. Another example, memory improvement. We help people improve their memory through a series of techniques and courses that we offer that are designed to train and improve your, your memory. So those are examples of bullseye keywords. They represent words that people would type into a search engine like Google that represent what they're looking for help with that represents what you help people with in your business. So when we looked at all of our bullseye keywords in market after market, we studied all of our clients' businesses and we looked at what was it that separated those that were successful against those that were not successful, we found that market size was incredibly important. When it comes to tossing your boat in the river, you don't want a river that's too big because you're gonna be swallowed up whole. You don't want a, um, a river that's too small because there's just not enough current to move you forward. You want a river that is just right. And in the book, we reveal exactly what that size is. So that's market size. Now another factor that I think is really important is this conversation around competition. Now competition is interesting. When I talk to people who are at the stage of just starting their business, trying to figure out what business to go into, inevitably it leads in one of several directions. People have an idea, they get super excited about it, so they go online, they do some searching, and they say, crap, somebody's already doing it. They close the door to the idea. Or they come up with an idea, they go online and they say, nobody's doing this. We're gonna get rich, this is great. And the reality is both of those situations are problematic for different reasons. One of my mentors taught me this phrase that's always stuck with me and I'll share it here. And he said, you know, Ryan, remember this, pioneers get shot, but settlers get rich. What he meant by that is you do not want to be the first to market. You don't wanna be the first one to try to sell something or figure something out online. If nobody's doing the thing that you're thinking of doing, chances are with the seven, eight billion people on the planet, listen, you're not the first person to have that idea. Chances are someone else tried it and wasn't able to make it work. Instead, what you're looking for is this. If you look at the most iconic companies of our time, you look at Google, you look at Facebook, you look at Apple, none of them were the first to market. Google was not the first search engine. Facebook was not the first social media platform. And Apple was not the first to sell smartphones or MP3 players. Instead, what they found is they found a market that was proven and they either built a better mousetrap or they did a better job with their messaging and marketing. So the secret is this, you wanna find a market where your competition